Navsari, a small town in present-day Gujarat, was for centuries home to Parsis of the priestly class. who kept alight the sacred fire and preserved a tradition of asceticism. Of the several families that stayed there, one Bairam adopted the name Tata, which literally meant one who is hot-tempered. In the year 1839, on the 3rd of March, a boy was born into the family who was named Jamsitji Nasarwanji Tata. The boy was initiated into the various rites of his religion. He served his novitiate and his name was inscribed among the priestly records. When he was 13, his father took him to Bombay and admitted him to the Elphinstone Institution. In the year 1856, Jamshed Ji joined the Elphinstone College, where he received a liberal education and acquired a love for reading, which lasted throughout his life. While still a student at the college, Jamshed Ji had a narrow escape from death. His study in his home was in an attic tower, very close to a rattling tile roof. During one terrific cyclone, his father rushed up from the floor below insisting that Jamshedji leave the house. The son obeyed and came down to the street filled with an excited and shrieking crowd. Suddenly, the nook he had occupied was torn away by the force of the wind and came crashing down at his feet. In 1858, Jamshedji Tata passed out as a green scholar from the Elphinstone College, then the equivalent of a degree. He had intended to follow one of the learned professions and entered for a time a solicitor's office. But, fortunately for Indian industry, necessity compelled him to go into business. In 1859, Jamshedji entered his father's firm, Nasirwanji and Kalyandas. By his mid-thirties, Jamshedji had acquired a fair degree of wealth and a reputation of being a canny businessman. He was planning a major investment in textiles and chose Nagpur to set up a mill. To the dismay of many who felt Bombay was the obvious choice. But Jamshedji knew Nagpur had easy reach to raw cotton, was amidst a profitable market and both coal and water were abundantly available. He struck a good bargain for a piece of marshy 10-acre land from the Raja of Nagpur and filled it up with earth to start operations. A local banker who had refused to invest in the mill later said, Mr. Tata had put earth into the ground and taken out gold. On the 1st of January 1877, the Empress Mills started operations. With the help of James Brooksby, the technical expert with the mill, he adopted the innovative ring frame technology, even before it was extensively used in England. The move doubled the production, share values zoomed, and Jamshedji's reputation as an astute industrialist was firmly established. Jamshedji was a benevolent employer, and his ideas were well into the future. He offered his people shorter working hours, well-ventilated workspaces, good living conditions, performance incentives, provident fund and gratuity long before they were made mandatory in India and the West. This stocky man with a gruff voice was full of wit and humour. He loved reading and his library had books on literature, technology, philosophy, travel, glassware, porcelain. There was no ceiling, really. His knowledge was encyclopedic, and ideas flowed non-stop. 
Jamshed ji loved an ingenious device and was a born pioneer. When the cinematograph first appeared, he acquired one at once. His carriages were the first to be fitted with rubber tires, whose silent progress amazed the crowd on the streets. As far back as 1901, he was seen driving a motor car in Bombay, which used to have frequent breakdowns, adding an element of adventure in the excursions. All his purchases were made not so much for himself as to let India know of the developments happening across the seas. Sir George King, chief curator of the Botanical Gardens in Calcutta, acknowledged after a chance meeting that he had actually learned something on plants from Jamshed ji. Jamshed ji loved Bombay. The kindly face, the snow white beard, and the Parsi pagadi were a familiar sight at the seafront taking early morning walks. By the end of the 19th century, Bombay had started paying the price for heavy industrialization. Soot and crime from the textile mills were polluting the city. Jamshed ji began working on a new project to supply hydroelectric power for a clean and smokeless city. Only two mill owners agreed to tap the power, but he still went ahead with it. What mattered to him most was that Bombay needed it. Once Jamshed ji was invited to dine at a fine city hotel by a foreign friend. When he walked in with his host, he was accosted by a supercilious hotel manager with the infamous line, "We don't allow Indians in here." Jamshed ji chose to reply carefully to this insult. He spent 3 lakh pounds to build the Taj Mahal Hotel. one of the finest in the world many called it tata's white elephant but as far as he was concerned bombay needed a world class hotel where indians would be treated without discrimination it was the first building in bombay to be lit by electricity jamshed ji's vision of philanthropy was almost radical he believed that creating opportunities for people would help fight poverty he felt it was important to support the talented and created a special fund to send students to go to england for higher studies later these thoughts translated into his vision for the indian institute of science he left half his wealth amounting to 30 lakh rupees to set up the institution which opened its doors in 1904 stalwarts like the nobel winner Dr C V Raman Dr Homi Bhava and Dr Vikram Sarabhai have headed this formidable place of learning Jamshed ji was an insatiable traveler right from the day he entered the world of business he traveled across the world in his quest for fulfillment of his ideas and his schemes when he was traveling on a ship to the US once He had a chance meeting with Swami Vivekananda who ignited in him the concept of swadeshi and self-dependence. The industrialist and the ascetic struck a lasting friendship and Jamshed ji was to be a champion of swadeshi all his life. It was in a tiny lecture hall in Manchester in 1869. that Jamshed ji heard Thomas Carlyle's fiery words the nation which gains control of iron soon acquires the control of gold from that moment onwards the quest for iron and the search for the man who could help find it became an obsession with him one late september he set sail for america and after weeks of perseverance He arrived at the cluttered desk of one Charles Page Perrin, a globally acknowledged geologist and metallurgist. For a long time, the two gazed at each other in silence. "Are you Charles Page Perrin?" the metallurgist 
nodded. At last, I have found the man I am looking for. Jamshedji's communication was precise. I have spoken to Mr. Kennedy. He will build the steel plant wherever you advise, and I will foot the bill. Will you come to India with me? Perrin was so dumbfounded, struck by the character, the force, the kindliness that radiated from Jamshedji's face, that all he could mutter was, Yes, yes, I will go with you. It was tough going for Perrin in the harsh and demanding land, with temperatures soaring to 125 degrees, and man-eating tigers, and rogue elephants as adversaries. His team eventually struck what could perhaps be three billion tons of iron ore in the hills of Guru Mahisani, in the Chotanagpur district, situated within 150 miles from Calcutta. Imagine building a city in a place like this a hundred years ago. But Jamshedji dreamed of providing a better life to his people. He planned the city which is now known as Jamshedpur, down to the last detail. His instructions were clear. Be sure to lay wide streets, planted with shady trees, every other of a quick-growing variety. Be sure that there is plenty of place for lawns and gardens. Reserve large areas for football, hockey and parks. Earmark areas for Hindu temples, Mohammedan mosques and Christian churches. For 30 years of his life, Jamshedji had dreamt of an iron and steel plant. And just when the project was beginning to take shape, he passed away in Germany. Fortunately, men like his son Dorab ensured that the dream lived on. Tata Steel, Asia's first integrated steel company, came into being in 1907. At the confluence of the two rivers, Shubarnurekha and Karkhai, in a village called Shakchi, about two and a half miles from the station of Kalimati on the Bengal Nagpur Railway. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of Independent India, had observed When you have to give the lead in action, in ideas, a lead which does not fit in with the very climate of opinion. That is true courage, physical, mental or spiritual, call it what you like. And it is this type of courage and vision that Jamshed Jitara showed. And it is right that we should honor his memory and remember him as one of the big founders of modern India.